Well, every time you went snowboarding, you knew you were on the fringes because you were the only one snowboarding. You couldn't move in the lift line because people were talking to you or they were looking at you. They just were, didn't know what you were. We're trying to promote our product and describe what it is and at the same time inform people about a new sport. Having an idea of a shape in your head and then finding out that it works for the kind of riding you want to do. All of his engineering genius was applied to this quest. banana. I started canoe back in 84. Back then there's this weird concept as to what works best in skiing and so then what's going to work best for snowboarding. And to decipher this mess is kind of trial and error. That summer, I really got to know Pete on some surf journeys. Pete was in college at the UW. On a surf trip, he's, he's, I think, starts thinking about it and going, maybe I want to be part of this. When Mike gave me a chance, I was like, this is better than any dream I had, and there's no way I wasn't going to do it and give it everything I had. One of the clearest memories for me was Mike and I riding up a chair and looking back at our marks at Ski Acres and there's some flat sections and I just remember seeing trenches where we were just railing carved turns and, I, and just looking at them, you could just see these deep gouges that like I'd never seen on the hill before. That year, the first year of no fins, just having camber and steel edges and, and super deep side cuts. We went to the Mount Baker Bank Slalom. Instead of running it down the course, they run it down now. They ran it down the Pan Dome, and it was super icy. It was a mock speed GS course that scared a lot of people away. But we were the sole entrance with no fins, steel edges, camber. Our boards were fast. And so we all blew out of the turns. We couldn't hold the Gs around the turns. We didn't even place. We did crappy. So we went home feeling defeated. We got our asses kicked. But I remember all of a sudden we started getting phone calls from Dan Donnelly, Amy Howitt, Marcella Dogos, Jay Cadden. They saw the speed that we had. All of a sudden, pretty much everybody at Baker wanted to ride our board. And that's right when Baker was starting to get on the map. And that's when we knew we had something going. Between 84 and 88, it's amazing looking at that four year compressed period and realize how much happened. Uh, the demand's been so large with snowboards that uh, the top three manufacturers uh, the last two years have been sold out midway through the season to where it's virtually impossible to get certain models. Then in 88, we started getting boards made in Austria. I hooked up with Paul A. I had zero money. When I met with Paul A, I led them to to believe that I had access to getting a bank loan, which I didn't even have that access. 
At the last minute, in the 11th hour, they, they started making prototypes for me. They made 5,500 snowboards for me with no letter of credit, no down payment, nothing but a handshake. Our distributor at the time ran a good business as far as they knew how to distribute. We had just signed a worldwide exclusive with them, but they didn't pay the bills. They owed us $400,000. So now we had no income and we were on a bank loan, $150,000 we owed the bank. We had to eat the bank loan, didn't get paid. And it, at the time, the business was in peril constantly. I had no idea if we were gonna have a job the next day. There's definitely some times where we sat on the porch kind of by ourselves and went, huh, uh, a couple of moments where you're just like, is this, is this working out? bank at the time and went down there and said give me 50 more thousand dollars I'm gonna start a new brand called LibTech and pay back the debt from these other guys that owe it on GNU and so I just felt that pressure you know and was it fun not at all but I want to do it again never I mean it's painful you know you can't sleep at night and but it makes you hungry and it makes yeah. you it makes you push the limits you're desperate you know? and you work long hours and you've got to get out of the yeah. situation and sometimes that's what it takes year of building, first, second year of building GNU's, I said, I hope someday to get to the size where we build a, a thousand boards a year. So that was the goal. Someday get big enough to build a thousand boards a year. Sounds like a lot, actually. Yeah. And now we, we have some days where we hit that a day. For me, an aha moment was riding up the chair and we went, we're going to put rocker between the feet, but in a full length board in the mainstream middle of the snowboard market, just right in the wheelhouse, and you're gonna step on the bindings, on the inserts, and you're gonna get full contact with a little bit of tip pressure, but it's gonna be pre-arced. Before we got to ride the prototypes, I had to write the entire brochure, exactly how it was gonna do, what it was gonna do to powder, how it was gonna jib, how it was gonna ride hard pack, how it was gonna carve. We had, Mike and I had to present it to the sales reps, not having ridden it, and say, hey, this is how it's gonna work, this is what it is, it's called the Skate Banana, you guys are gonna love it here. We're just getting traction with the retailers with Magna Traction, and now all of a sudden we, we, we come to SIA with Skate Banana. 
Retailers were just laughing at us. Competitors were laughing. They thought it was a joke. Bananas. Bananas. <laughs> Come to, I think it was November or something. December. I December, we finally got the prototypes built. They gave them to me to test the first one. I sat in my room for two days because I was afraid to ride it. I was like, what if, what if it doesn't do what we said it was going to do? And then I went up to Ski Acres and I got off the lift and I rode down and it hooked up and did a perfect arc and I stopped and buckled in and every turn was better than the next. I ran into Jesse Burton that day and he said it was the best jib board he'd ever ridden. And I called Temple the day after that and he came up and rode it and he loved the way it carved. And then I knew we had two dudes that were backing it besides me. And then we believed in it so much between December and end of January that we threw it in a bunch of lines. Running wild, lost control. Running wild, mighty bold. Feeling gay, reckless too. What I say, I'm not the simpleton I used to be. I wonder how I got that way. Once I was full of sentiment, it's true. But now I've got yeah. a fool heart. With all that other foolishness, I'm through. Gonna play a woman's part. I'm a running wild, lost control. Running wild, mighty bold. Feeling gay, reckless too. Every mind all the time, never blue Always going, go nowhere Always showing, I don't care Don't love nobody, cause it ain't worthwhile All alone and running To be honest, I really can't think of it. a path we went down and it didn't work. So it is interesting. The track record's about as close as you can get to 100% as far as ideas in shapes. They've worked. And yet, yeah, when we come up with a new idea, there's a whole lot more skeptics than there are believers. That's for sure. And you just, you kind of just have to have thick skin and you just, you, you kind of giggle inside just watching everyone be skeptics. Through a lot of tough situations, we just had that relentless drive to figure out how to make it work no matter what. I think that's part of what's been, both of us have just been completely committed to board sports and building boards. It was the most tech piece of equipment, but didn't work well at all at a resort. A whole collection of torch songs, and still you got no fire. Here's who one was inside a waste, it's out with the old and in with the new. There was no snowboarding. We called it surfing on snow. Uh, there's even a, a mention in one of our first ad, we called it gravity travel. We were trying to pioneer something, we were trying to be clever. In the mid 70s, skateboarding was just blowing up. I mean, it was so big. This product idea looked like it should already exist. There ought to be thousands of 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds having fun with this right now. Where is it? Well, let's make it, you know, let's do it. 
The way I was getting my thrills in 1975 was commuting to work on my 10 speed. I lived on 14th Street. I rode up to Central Park at 59th Street. My dad got Ski Magazine. In the corner of the page was a What's New? And there was a picture of a woman. It describes that she's snow surfing. And Dmitry Milovich makes these boards. And there was a dress in Utah. And so I wrote to him. So I said, hey, how about if we maybe do a trade? I'll work up some designs for logos for your product, and you could make me a board. It would have been 1976, when I went out to visit Dimitri and Renee, and we did some boarding. I made a couple turns, and it just, I was completely intoxicated. We just shook hands, and I said, I'll be back. Uh, we were blessed with powder. We didn't even have to think about hardback. Although some of these early boards over here, you'll see all, all had steel edges 15 years ago, and some of them were actually aimed for hardback, but only in an emergency sort of way when you had to cross the trails. This was a pretty interesting board. I think this is one of the first boards that actually flexed. Yeah, you can hear it. And I remember one of the hardest things about building the board was finding aquarium gravel in all the rainbow colors. Here we go, 75. The first truly flexible board was snap. I think it was just pure passion. You know, mixed in with the idea of like, this is going to be big, this is going to be hot, you know, a lot of people are going to love this. I know Dimitri had a, a very positive feeling that this was going to be a great opportunity. And the idea was you put your foot under the strap and you were on there. He was completely invested in it. All of his time, all of his attention, all of his engineering genius was applied to this quest. We'd have our hiking boots and we'd, you'd make a set of stairs. It was, it was a lot of work. You know, and you look at your tracks and you look at the little snake line of tracks and say, okay, I'm not gonna screw this up. Okay, and you get ready and you get set and you feel your weight and you feel your feet and I'm ready, I'm gonna do it and it's gonna be good and it's gonna be fun and I'm not gonna screw up. And sometimes that worked. <laughs> <laughs> Our goal was to go to the snow show in Las Vegas in March of 77. There were no other board makers like four booths down doing anything like what we were doing. I think we walked away with a few dealers, dealers in quotes, people who were interested enough to say, yes, I'll take two, ship them when they're ready. There wasn't much growth. The product didn't take off because it was aimed at a very small market.
When you got right down to it, the winter stick was going to be used by someone who would be hiking in the backcountry. The practicalities of pulling that off are difficult, if not impossible. Financially, we were um, we weren't doing that well. We started to approach ski areas. Dimitri went and had meetings, and you know, mostly got a cold reception. And there would be. You know, quizzical questions. Why would you want to do this if you have skis? Why do we need this? How does that work? Well, what do you do in the flats? It's funny looking. Snowboard didn't want us. Alta definitely didn't want us. I don't think Brighton did either. We had our hands full trying to make product. We had our hands full trying to stay alive. I think the whole idea of, of uh, surfing on snow came from the impulse I had when I was a kid to stand on a sled and it's a pretty natural. I think he gave so much of himself and you have to imagine what he did. He left college and he put all of his life savings, a lot of family money and devoted it to this enterprise which, you know, ultimately did not fulfill his dreams. Had a lot of flotation and uh, not much else. There's, there's probably some disappointment. He probably just doesn't want to uh, remember a lot of the time he spent. It's mostly because of work of people like Jake Burton and Tom Sims that snowboarding has become as big as it has. Those guys persevered on making equipment that would work on hard pack, and it's because of that that it has been accepted and, it, and the, it has grown to the level it's, it is now. I wish, I wish he would get uh, the recognition he deserves. The fact that the sport became something and that it grew and that it was popular, that was part of our vision. The way that most of the boards are constructed today, the way the bindings were created and having edges and we were reluctant to see that. You know, in retrospect, we weren't quick and easy. I think we achieved a good part of what we are after, which was a pure experience. And you know, the pure experience is in the backcountry. 
or in your own little backyard or hillside. So that, uh, that first impulse led to the idea that, yeah, maybe you can surf on snow. We're in Revelstoke, BC, and it's known to be fairly deep and dry around here. That kind of riding just leads to kind of shorter, wider shapes, older shapes maybe, swallowtails. I think it's just kind of having an idea of a shape in your head and then finding out that it works for the kind of riding you want to do. There's definitely people that are really interested in simplifying their snowboarding experience and also at the same time trying something new, which reconnects them to something old. We get the, the wood from the local mill here, so it's all trees that are cut down locally. We get a lot of snow here during the winter. Our boards are designed really just to hold their speed, to go fast in the powder, they would handle it. I would hope he would feel pride. He should feel really good about the little piece that he created, we created in the in the history of the sport. Dropping it five, four, three, two, drop. Beating a play glass window with my friends. I never thought it could end like this. Beating a play glass window. Well, this is the first year that I've seen, you know, lots of surfing guys up on the slopes. Uh, I think they just have seen enough of it. Now they just can't stand it any longer. They got to try it. <laughs>